Um, hello everyone, my name is Oliver Caldwell and uh, I am a software engineer at Viasat within the Lono Cloud team. Uh, and I've been there since May this year. Um, it's a wonderful team, uh, mostly based in the US, so I'm working remotely for them, right in closure full time. Uh, and we are hiring, so if anyone's really interested, please do get in touch uh, and I can forward you on to the people uh, that you need to talk to. So the goal of my talk um, is to basically fill in knowledge gaps across all experience levels uh, and to show what's possible with a REPL. So I'm going to be showing things, showing tools that you might not have used and might not ever use, but hopefully it's to, it will open your eyes to certain ideas through the lens of something uh, unfamiliar. Um, so a little history on, on the tools I've used and the ways of interacting with REPLs. I started in uh, Vim because I love Vim and I always loved using Vim uh, with Fireplace, uh, which is a plugin for uh, closure support and REPL interaction. Uh, eventually I was coerced into using uh, Spacemax and Emacs uh, for a couple of years and uh, then moved back to Vim and then to NeoVim and then I started writing my own tooling and I've been doing that for about the past two years now. Um, and I've, I've reworked the UX and implementation of my, my Clojure REPL tooling uh, probably two or three times now. It was written in Rust and then Clojure and then uh, a Lisp uh, that compiles into Lua and executes within NeoVim directly. And that's where I've ended up so far. Um, so that's that's working really well and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that. Uh, and so far it's a local maximum. So I've, I've explored the space of REPL tooling a fair bit. I've tried a lot of things. Uh, a few different extremes, and I've spent a long time working on my own ideals. Uh, and I've built up like quite a few users for that, I think. Uh, quite a few people like the UX and the way it works, but it's still quite niche. So I hope to spread some of these ideas to you today. Um, so let's get started with uh, what is a REPL? Uh, and I know this is very basic, but uh, my, my goal here is, is to um, bring something for every level of experience. Uh, of Clojure developer, so somebody who's just looking into it, somebody who's been working in Clojure for uh, full time for the last four years. Like, I want everyone to be able to get something out of this. So, uh, a REPL is something that reads source code uh, from a string, so like plus one, two, um, and it turns that into data. It then evaluates that data, so it executes it and turns it into some result. It will then turn it back into a string and print that result and then loop back to the beginning, ready to read more input. Uh, so REPLs deal in strings. Uh, strings go in, strings come out. Um, what's neat about this is that a REPL client and a REPL server can be different languages. Because the medium is strings, they don't need to be the same language. They don't need to understand each other. Uh, so this is mostly seen uh, in the standard input or output on the command line REPL. Um, so the standard IO REPL is uh, pretty great for teaching because you can just get into it straight away. You can just type closure on the command line and you're in, you can now run code. It's, it's really powerful, you can do anything with it, but it isn't integrated into your workflow. So uh, in the world of uh, a developer relying on a standard IO REPL uh, on your, on, in your terminal, um, editing and evaluating are separate concepts. Um, so your editor environment with all your powerful editing tools is completely separate uh, to your evaluation environment. It might be embedded as a terminal within your editor, but it's not part of your text buffer where you have all of your little mappings and keybinds and whatever you want to use. So there's two different worlds you have to think about there. Um, I know Emacs kind of blurs that line a bit. Uh, so we can actually add a bunch of dependencies to make that uh, better. So you can add like Bruce Hellman's Rebel read line, makes it much easier to understand and work with and write in. Um, but you're still, you're still limited in some ways. It's still separate. You still end up copying and pasting things between these two things. So um, we can actually show a quick REPL here. Uh, so if I type COJ, there you go. We now have a closure REPL. Let's make that a bit bigger. And if I do uh, plus one, two, we have a result. That gives us three. Excellent. So this is very good for teaching people because you can just show them it straight away. The problems start to arise um, when we try to do something such as uh, printlin hello. 
So you get hello and nil back there. What happens if I type hello and nil here? We get the exact same result. So two different inputs can lead to the same result. This isn't immediately bad. As humans, we're fine understanding this. But uh, if you're writing a computer program or a plugin or something to understand this output, you're going to have a bad time uh, because we are losing information. We don't know what is a standard out. We don't know what's a result. Uh, we can't tell, um, which is unfortunate. So we lose information. Um, the closure 1.10, I think, maybe 1.9 to some extent, brought us the socket REPL and PREPL. Um, these don't require any dependencies. They're built in. Uh, a socket REPL is just the standard IO REPL over a socket. So we can talk to this REPL remotely, but it's the same experience. We still lose information. Um, it allows you to access uh, remote machines or Docker containers. Uh, so we can evaluate things that aren't like within our terminal. Um, the prepl adds structure. Uh, so, and <laughs> prepl should be all lowercase from what I could find. I think Stu Halloway mentioned it on a mailing list one time uh, that it's always lowercase prepl, but I, ca I can't find it again. It was on the Google group, I think. Um, but yeah, write it however you want, but I think it's supposed to be lowercase prepl. Um, it's still string input, but a prepl outputs uh, results wrapped in Eden. Um, and it allows us to identify whether it's a standard out, standard error, a returned value, or a tap value. Uh, so you can you can tell what kind of result you got. So you don't lose that information anymore. It's not all string out, it's Eden out. Um, and that's good for simple things. Uh, there's no real way to extend it. Uh, there is the unrepl, uh, which is, is kind of a similar project that is, I think, a bit more extensible and kind of you inject it into a socket REPL and it upgrades that socket REPL into something that behaves a bit like a PREPL. So it adds some structure. Um, so that's not really maintained, but uh, there's some interesting ideas there that we might be able to take into any kind of PREPL development. Uh, so we can still learn from unrepl. Um, so yeah, the, the downside is it's kind of rigid. It gives you some structure, but it doesn't give you some hooks to build upon these ideas. Um, so there's third party options when it comes to remote REPL execution. Uh, we have nREPL, which is the most popular one. You may have heard of this. Um, you may not have, but you may have been using it uh, under the hood of your, your editor tooling. I actually frowned upon using nREPL at first for my tooling um, because of some issues I came into with uh, Vim and Fireplace where things would get out of sync and things would stop working some days after an update. Uh, and it was just kind of like some things, it was really unfortunate probably and during a time where things were moving fast and different projects couldn't keep up with each other, I think. But I eventually came around to the idea. It's, it's actually really well built, works really well. The general idea is just sound. Um, we, in this instance, we use structured input and output. So uh, we, use we don't just send code, we send a message. And if we want to evaluate something, we send a, an evaluation message. Um, and we get output wrapped in the same way so we know what we got back out and what it came from and what caused it. Uh, so we get even more information than a prepl. Um, we can also add uh, middleware. So you can add the cider middleware and a bunch of other different ones. And they add more superpowers to this, this nREPL. They add more things you can do that just are not possible. They allow you to do things with ClojureScript that are not possible with the prepl implementation in ClojureScript. Um, Emacs and CIDR uh, rely on this, um, but they don't expose too much. It, it's kind of it's kind of hidden away, uh, which is good because you don't want to be worrying about these things under the hood. Um, and they work over Ben code by default or B encode, which I think was written for a torrent client originally. So the encoding of messages we send and receive to an mRepl are uh, B encoded. Uh, which is kind of language agnostic and you can find implementations in every language basically. Pretty easy to write an encoder or decoder for. So you can write plugins for this quite easily in any language. Uh, because if it was using Eden as a transport, I would struggle to find a good Eden parser in Lua, for example, or VimScript. Uh, so I think newer versions do support Eden as well as a transport. If you did want to use that, then you can do. Um, and Propel there is a, another option that's uh, what I wrote when I was building Prepl-based tooling. It makes it as easy as the nREPL command line to start a Prepl server. 
So it kind of wraps up a bunch of obscure options that you need to uh, configure for preples and uh, makes it as easy to start as an mrepl and it creates like a .prepl port file, just like a .nrepl port file. Uh, so it's just a convenience wrapper that makes it feel a bit more nrepl-y. Um, so sockets are good. Uh, sockets allow us to evaluate stuff remotely. That's great. And there's different ways we can do it. Um, but they are only as good as the client because there's two sides to REPL development. Uh, there's the encoding and the medium and whether it's strings in, strings out. Um, and then there's also the clients and their U UX and usability and how you interact with them. Um, so let's explore my personal UX, uh, the one I designed and built. Um, through multiple iterations um, and show you different ways of looking at these ideas. So this here is uh, the uh, Kanja school script. This will, as long as you have an up-to-date near them, like 0.4 plus, drop you into the Kanja school um, and clean up after itself when it's done. Uh, I already have uh, this installed, so I'm just going to do Kanja school. And now we're in the school and I'm not going to read everything in the interest of time but it basically explains to us how we can evaluate things. So this is Fennel, which compiles to Lua and runs within NeoVim. Uh, so we are running a Lisp within NeoVim. It's a very closure Lisp. Uh, Conjure supports multiple Lisps. It supports uh, Clojure, Racket, Janet, um, uh, Fennel, and that's it so far. But I have a bunch of other plans like Common Lisp down the road, um, all with the same mapping. So I can evaluate this whole buffer with comma EB. So that evaluated the buffer. And in the top right there, the heads up display has appeared and shown us the uh, latest result. Uh, and the result was less than one of seven complete. Um, and then we get told about the log and we can open this log. So that HUD was a little view into the log buffer. I can do comma LV and open the log buffer in a vertical split, which is an editable buffer. I can put more things in here and evaluate. And then the results appear down here. And this will auto scroll if you've got your cursor on the last line, just like a terminal. Um, I can go into this form here and I can do comma EE. -E. I'm going to zip through this. Uh, so <laughs> I've evaluated this form here and it printed out more. So we've moved on to the next step. Uh, it's explaining how we can evaluate the root form, which is this, this form. So from anywhere within here, we can evaluate the root form. So the outermost parentheses, so comma ER evaluated the root. And then we move on to the next step. And you can see the um, the log is proceeding here. We're getting through the lessons. I can open a tab if I want to, or open a, a horizontal split if I need to. Uh, so there's a few different ways to open, open splits there. Um, so the other thing we can do is um, paste the results of evaluation. So my evaluations are stored in my clipboard. Uh, so I can actually paste and the previous evaluation was stored in a register uh, automatically for me. And you can configure what register that goes to. Uh, the next one I can show is eval and replace form. So comma E exclamation mark. It evaluated this form and replaced it with its result. So you can see we've done three out of seven and then four out of seven. So we're slowly making our way through. Um, this is talking about marks. So Vim has a concept of marks. So I can do MF. And then I can go somewhere else and I can do backtick F and it takes me to that mark. What Kundra allows me to do is comma EMF that evaluated the mark F. So that moved my cursor to this form, ran the evaluation and moved back without ever updating the screen. Uh, this will work cross file if you use an uppercase mark as well, because uppercase marks are cross file in them. So you can do uh, M capital F go to another part of your project and still be able to evaluate that form with comma M or EM capital F. Uh, there's a lot of mappings here, so it's all going to be very confusing. But the general idea is that you can evaluate things at a distance, uh, which is very useful sometimes. Uh, we can also evaluate a word under the cursor, comma EW. And you can see in the top right there, this is the contents of school.lesson5 message. Uh, yes, it is indeed. Um, and we can do general um, like visual selections as well, which is very useful. Um, I can do a, a motion. I can do comma e i w. That did similar to comma e w. I evaluated in the word, but I did it through a motion. Um, and the same here. Evaluate a form by specifying parentheses. 
Uh, and that's all the school has to show. So you can go through this at your own pace and get a feel for some of the messages and read my, my help a bit more. Uh, and speaking of help, we can also evaluate this little thing here, which evaluates the vim help command for Kanja. And it drops us into Kanja's help text. And then you can scroll through here and have a read of all the mappings and configuration and everything's documented. So hopefully that will be fairly insightful. Okay, let's keep moving. I hope that was uh, a good little taste and you're interested to find out more. Um, yeah, feel free to go and check out the school. Give me some feedback on that. I have a Discord for Kanja as well. Anyone that loves Lisps and Vim, you're more than welcome. I'm trying to join all of our Lispy worlds together uh, through Kanja as a, as a conduit or a bridge. Um, so anyone that is interested in that area, please swing by. Um, so REPLs are uh, language agnostic. Like that was Fennel I was showing you there. Um, but Clojure has uh, some specific magic because all languages are different. Uh, even if we can evaluate them, uh, everyone has different strengths. Uh, Clojure has a particularly powerful REPL experience and that's all thanks to the community, really. So we have like uh, change namespace refreshing. Uh, with tools namespace refresh. We have completions via complement in Clojure and Clojure script. So you get full IntelliSense completion um, from your editor connected to your browser through Clojure script. And that's fantastic. It works amazingly. Um, in Emperor 0.8 and above, we get completions and uh, symbol information lookup um, without any middleware. So we require less dependencies. So the base and REPL experience has got far more powerful. Uh, which is fantastic. I still need to integrate that, but not much to do there. Um, we get go to definition, which is such a good, powerful feature that normally requires a huge IDE and indexing and searching. We get that off the bat and it's updated live because we talk to a real running application and say, hey, where is this code found? Um, we get documentation lookup, which we could do as we type. We get function argument hints as you type um, in, most in most editors. Um, we can view the source of a function without moving the cursor. Uh, in Conjure, I can do comma vs, and it will view source. Um, we can run all the tests uh, on in, in a namespace or on an individual form. Um, we get mRepl sessions, which I'll touch on just a second. Um, and we get uh, editor plugins uh, to allow us to jack in. So um, Vim, there's one for Vim and there's one for Emacs. I think Cider has it built in actually, that allow you to start a REPL from within your editor while you're working on your project. Um, and they, they are yeah really useful for quickly getting a REPL open and being able to uh, evaluate something within a file uh, on a whim without having to remember to go set up a REPL. Um, so mREPL sessions that I just mentioned. Um, mREPL gives us sessions uh, and they allow us to have multiple processes running and even multiple languages running. Um, and CIDR has its own concept of sessions, but they're completely unrelated. So I don't think it exposes this concept of sessions. I think Conjure exposes them and allows that is a first class concept, but I don't think CIDR does. Uh, they're a great tool that is hidden away in, in, in most cases. Uh, they allow you to hop between different languages. They allow you to perform long running executions in one session, hop to another session, perform some evaluations, and then see the result of your long running one at some point, and maybe go back to that session and perform some more evaluations. Uh, and you can see this screenshot from Conjure here. Um, you can hop between your sessions and rather than displaying a, a UID, which is kind of unfriendly, I've replaced them all with cat and dog uh, breed names. Um, so it's a bit easier to understand uh, what what they are and relate to them a bit. So every time you open up a new, a new REPL session with Conjure, every time you connect to a server, you get a new little like connected to Greyhound, connected to uh, Corgi. Uh, um, so that adds a little bit of uh, readability to it, I think. But yeah, they're, they're a really cool feature. Definitely check those out. I don't think they're very well known, um, but I use them all the time. Um, so namespace refreshing. Um, what is namespace refreshing? It's, I mentioned it on the closure uh, superpower slide. Um, it's basically a concept of loading ch namespaces from disk that have changed since the last time you did this refresh. Uh, and it loads them in the right order. So in dependency order um, and it integrates with uh, component systems like Stuart Sierra's component, and you can set it up to start and stop your system at the right times. So you've got to make sure that you have a zero argument stop function for your system uh, and a zero argument start function for your system. So something that will say Stuart Sierra component stop and start uh, needs to have a zero argument function to do that. 
and then you can hook up your editor tooling to those functions in Emacs or Cider or whatever you use so that when you refresh it cleanly shuts down the system and then turns it back on when it's done refreshing. Um, so you should configure your editor to be able to do that. Um, make sure you get this working from day one. If not, I highly recommend you getting your editor uh, working with your system um, as soon as possible um, because it allows you to work within a real running system. Uh, I work inside Docker containers and I uh, edit the files on disk uh, that are mounted into the containers and then I use refresh to refresh those changed files and restart my system and reload the handlers uh, as and when I change them. Because restarting your REPL is a red flag. Uh, ideally, you want to be uh, reloading from just a, uh, a file or a buffer. Uh, so just evaluating the file is enough to see your changes reflected um, in your running application. Um, but if that's not enough, uh, if you can't just evaluate a form or a file, uh, you should be ensuring you can do so through refresh tooling. Um, because restarting your REPL is a last resort and you should always try to avoid it if you can. It's just wasted time, really. Um, so we can actually, we can type closure into a REPL. Uh, we can send it from an editor, but we can also send code from bash to an existing REPL. Um, so I use this in my blog to send a refresh call into my blog's running process uh, to rebuild the ASCII doc into HTML. Um, and I, I watch files for changes with a program called ENTR and send a rebuild call to my REPL whenever, whenever I need to. Um, and this could be used in, our, in, in development uh, to trigger or configure things while they're running. Um, so uh, let me just show you quickly a uh, REPL. Um, let's just start this REPL. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I need another REPL. So let's start a socket REPL. Here you go, you got a REPL and run send code. And here you go, it started a REPL over on my right hand side, um, connected to it, uh, sent some code to it, and we got the result. And I can do the same with a PREPL. So let's start a PREPL and send some code to that. And you can see we got some results and they are wrapped in data. So we know what kind of result we got, which is really useful. Um, and we can take this whole idea a bit further. So we could do closure executing closure. Um, and we start to get a bit Erlangy at that point. Um, it could be used to offload work elsewhere. So we could send code to another system and have it evaluated and get the results back. Um, uh, but it would also potentially allow remote code execution. Uh, so you'd want to be careful with these ports and where you're exposing them. Um, but this kind of like uh, this sending closure idea doesn't need to be program to program. It can also be human to program. So because you don't need any dependencies here, you don't need mrepl and prod, you can use prepl to write your kind of own custom debuggers and connect them to your prod servers through a, a VPN or whatever. So you are connecting to a port that nobody else can access um, and be able to debug your live running application without any extra dependencies in your, in your running app. Um, so prepl is really good for simple tools like this that have one purpose. Uh, not so good for IDE-like features where you want multiple evaluations happening at the same time uh, because as we saw, nREPL is really good for that. We have sessions and we can hop between things and cancel things. Um, but yeah, PREPL is really interesting idea that I don't think anyone is really using in practice yet. Uh, but I think it's, yeah, definitely opens up some really interesting ideas for sending code to things that are already running because startup time is pretty horrendous for us. Um, and if we can avoid that and just send the right code at the right time, um, yeah, it might help you solve some really interesting problems. Um, you could potentially upload new server, new code to your server, and then send a refresh call to your server. And there you go, you've deployed. Um, I'm not sure if I'd recommend it, but it could be a fun experiment. Um, and I should wrap up now. I'm getting into my, uh, my last minute. Um, but we're going to have questions during the Q&A in a little while. I hope you found this interesting. There's a bunch of links here. Uh, check out my blog, Bolly Me UK. Um, if you're interested in more prepl related things, I have a bunch of writings on there. Um, there's uh, a lot of information about how prepls work and all of my findings about them. Uh, and there's a few links to plugins and tools that I recommend. Definitely check out Conja if you are a lover of Lisps and uh, quite like Vim. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed and learned something. Uh, yeah, I look forward to your questions. Thank you.